So I want to introduce Jenny uh, Mitchman, who uh, some of you may have actually met in person or followed her travels when she was out on what Shelf Awareness called the world's longest book tour, when she took her family and went on the road to bookstores and libraries and all over the place to launch her first novel, uh, Cover of Snow. Uh, Jenny is an author of psychological thrillers. Her most recent book is The Second Mother. Um, she has won the Mary Higgins Clark Award, been nominated for other awards, including the Penn Faulkner, McCavity, and the Anthony Awards. Um, she has received star reviews from Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, and Book List, among other publications. Uh, Jenny is the co-chair of International Thriller Writers Debut Programs. And today our workshop is what agents want and how to give it to them. And over to you, Jenny. Thank you, Frankie. And hi, everyone. Hi, emerging mystery authors and published authors and mystery fans. Frankie, thank you. And thank you to the Sisters in Crime. Um, Frankie, on that world's longest book tour, I went to so many sync chapters and I just have a place in the heart for my or the organization. So I'm very happy to be here with the Mavens of Mayhem today and all of you. I want to give a plug for uh, Mysteries on Main. I call it the bookstore that's worth a drive. Um, it's truly one of my favorites. I've done World's Longest Book Tour events there. I've done Take Your Child to a Bookstore Day, Days There. And I would like to say that today, anybody who buys a book through Mysteries on Main doesn't have to be one of mine, though I'd certainly be happy if you discovered my work. But anyone who buys a book today through Mysteries on Main, which is worth the drive once the pandemic is over, um, take a screenshot, save your receipt, email it to me. You'll be entered to win a writer's wish list package. So remember that Mysteries on Main, worth the drive. So today we are going to be discussing what I call the who, what, where, and why, the five W's of pitching. We're going to go in a little bit of reverse order, and I'm hoping that we'll, there's a lot of material, and often this is done as a workshop, like in an intensive in-person, but it's great that Sisters in Crime has set this up virtually so that we can have, you know, the next best thing. I'm going to hope that we can cover the material and save plenty of time for questions, which as Kim said, you'll put in the chat, she will read them to me. I would definitely invite anybody who has a question that doesn't get answered, follow up with me by email. I will always get back to you. You can find me on social too. The almost was gonna be that I've been going dark on social media. So if you don't find me there, it's cause I'm taking a little holiday, come email me. I would love to you know, chat individually about what you might wanna follow up on. So let's talk about the pitch. We're gonna go in a little bit of reverse order because who, what, where, and why usually get to what at the um, beginning but we're not gonna do that because the what of a pitch is kind of the meat and potatoes of this presentation. So let's, I will tell you just very briefly, the what is a pitch is the tool you use to sell your book. So once you have a completed manuscript or a book in mind, you're going to wanna start thinking about your pitch unless you're just writing for your own fun in a garret, which I am a big fan of. If you're doing that, that's wonderful. Um, because writing, you know, especially mysteries, thrillers, suspense, it just can imbue so much excitement and exhilaration, I think, in my days and hopefully yours. But if you're not writing just for yourself and the family, you probably are gonna have to pitch at some point. A pitch is the ultimate selling tool. But let's talk with the who. So the most common person who's going to get your pitch is an agent. If you wanna be published by a top 10 uh, biggest publisher in the United States. So that includes the big five, which is soon to be the big four, right? So that's Simon & Schuster is probably gonna be acquired by Penguin Random House, unless there's an antitrust violation. And then there's also Hachette and Macmillan and um, HarperCollins. Those are the big four to be. And then there are also some big established independent publishers like Sourcebooks, Algonquin, Kensington, and between all of those and the imprints within them, those are who you are going to reach out to if you want your mystery or suspense or romantic suspense or women's relationship thriller, whatever it is, all of those kinds of books to be published commercially in the United States. So top 10 US publishers. 
they all work with literary agents. That means it's very hard to communicate with them directly. Every now and then a publisher like St. Martin's will have a like no agents kind of hiatus and you can get to them directly. But you need an agent for more than just selling your book and getting you a book deal. You need an agent to guide your career and to do all sorts of things. So unless you plan to self-publish, probably at some point you'll be doing what's called querying agents. And for that, you'll need a pitch. The other who that your pitch is gonna go to is a small independent or micro press. So those do not require literary agents. There's a wonderful mystery author named Tori Eldridge. She publishes, um, I hope I have the name right because I'm terrible with uh, book title names. It's the Ninja's Daughter series and I'm sure um, Patty at Mysteries on Main can order it for you. She's published by Polis Books, which um, some of you know, might know Jason Hintner. I think I have that name right. He's the owner of it. So sometimes there'll be interesting small micro presses that publish mysteries that you actually don't need an agent for. Um, you'll still need a pitch, however. And you'll also need a pitch if you're going to a pitch conference. I don't know if the Mavens of Mayhem, maybe somebody in the chat can let me know, have ever public, uh, sponsored a pitch conference. But there are wonderful pitch conferences. Um, International Thriller Writers does one at Thriller Fest. New York Writers Workshop hosts one. If you're going to a pitch conference where you're gonna sit down with an agent or an editor, you'll need a pitch. Also, the final, it's probably not final. I'm sure somebody will be like, Jenny, what about that? Don't I need a pitch? Yes. Um, you always need a pitch. You need a pitch for Christmas morning because there'll be people like sitting around the tree and you can be like, let me tell you about my book. Um, it's so hard on Zoom because I don't know if anybody laughed at that, but I found it really amusing. Anyway, the fourth category of people you will need a pitch for are kind of soft networking opportunities. And that starts, once you have a book, that starts to happen all the time. You know, you meet somebody who's an author and I cannot tell you how many times I went to a book event, sat next to an author, you know, maybe who knew the speaker author and lo and behold, I started describing my book because I had a really good pitch in mind. And they said, my agent might like that or somebody I know. So you want to have a pitch as soon as you're starting to think in terms of publication and getting your book out there. It's actually not a bad idea, even if you are going to indie or self-publish, because as we'll see in this workshop, a pitch is just a great, great tool for encapsulating your book. So when do I start pitching? We're skipping over from the who to the when. When do I start pitching? This is what I wrote down. When you think you are ready, you still have a ways to go. After that, when you think you are ready, you still have a ways to go. And the reason why I say that, maybe not everybody out there is gonna be susceptible to this mistake, but I know I certainly was. I think a lot of writers, maybe it's just me, but a lot of writers, I think, I hope, have a tendency to feel like the book is ready before it's ready. And this continues long past the pitching stage. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times once I had an agent and I had an editor, this thing was locked and loaded, it was gonna be published, that I would write to my editor um, in the subject line, final version. And that would be like, you know, 10 drafts before it got to Mysteries on Main and hit the shelves. So because we writers have a tendency, and we could go into this in some other workshop, or you can all be like, no, Jenny, I always know it's not ready. Um, and that is the opposite problem, actually. There are some writers who feel like it's never ready. I could go over it for years and years. You want to hit the sweet spot between the two. But because we, at least some of us tend to think it's ready before it is, this is what I recommend doing to really be ready. When you have a finished manuscript, put it in a drawer. Wait as long as you can stand, unless you know that you're a procrastinator, it's gonna be like five years. Jenny told me to wait as long as I can stand and you know, I still have 50 years in me, no, we don't want that. But wait a good long while and then take it out of the drawer and read it through. And I really would love to hear from anybody who does that and is like, it was even better than I thought. Because every time I take it out of a drawer, I'm like, oh my gosh, it, you know, thank goodness I did not send this out before I put it in the drawer and took it out. Put it in the drawer, wait a while. Then it's called the rule of three. You're going to give your manuscript to as many independent readers as you can find, except if you're the type to want to keep finding readers and then no, I did, Jenny did not tell you to go find an army to send it to. But you're going to want to give your manuscript to independent readers and we'll discuss how to get them. And you're going to want to revise according to the rule of three. This is the rule of three. 
some feedback will be clearly wrong. You'll hear it and it'll just be clear that this reader does not really get what you're doing. It doesn't resonate. Maybe it's not their type of genre, but also maybe it, the book puts them off for some reason, but you kind of know that, that that feedback you don't have to worry about. The second kind of feedback, you'll hear it and you'll be like, oh, I was you know, nine on this point and I didn't know what was wrong, but something was and you put it into, thank goodness I sent it to you before I started pitching. And then the third kind of feedback, I call this neurotic protagonist feedback. And if we had more time, I'd tell you why. So someday when we meet, ask me why it's neurotic protagonist feedback. The third kind of feedback will be, it'll feel like it's glaringly wrong. You'll hear it and you'll wanna, if you're me, claw the eyes out of the person who gives it to you. But you won't do that because you know we're mystery writers and we sublimate that all into the page. You'll feel like it's completely wrong. And that will be your sign to yourself that you really better sit with this feedback and figure out where it might be getting something that will make this book so much better if you can work with the feedback somehow. So the rule of three. So then you've revised your manuscript. It's getting better and better and better, but you need readers. And so you're gonna get your readers from the pool of three. I think I kind of reversed the order of these, but that's okay. You can follow up with me to clarify. clarify. So the pool of three is where you're gonna get your readers um, for the independent feedback. You could just kind of lasso them on the street, but if you don't wanna do that, these are the three groups that I have always called from. One is friends and family. And I know a lot of people are like, don't give, but that's because they're afraid that you'll give it to your mom and your mom will be like, oh, sweetie, you wrote a whole book. That's awesome. You wanna find friends and family you can trust to be honest and give you really constructive feedback. We need our friends and family, I think, in the pool of three because they're the people that we can be like, oh, I think I got it, but I'm not sure. You're not gonna to go to an, you're not gonna have a chance with an agent or an editor, probably. Maybe once they've already acquired you, but even then you're not gonna to wanna to waste them on like 10, you know, 12 reads. So you want some friends and family that you trust to give good independent feedback. Then, a writer's group, Sisters of Crime is great for this, right? Because they have the guppies. A writer's group where you're not necessarily going to get feedback that falls into the categories that are helpful in the rule of three from every member of a writer's group, but you'll be able to probably select or call a couple that you really, you know, have kind of a sense of kismet with, and those people might go on to be your trusty readers for years and years to come. And then finally, the way I most like, once the manuscript is in you know, pretty good shape, like you think it's, it's ready to go, but we know it's not, probably. Um, find a, a book group, a book club, sorry. Um, and ask them if they would be willing to take your manuscript on just as another book selection, because you can give it to them as a PDF, you can give it to them on their you know, e-devices, or you can print out a copy and, and bind it. Um, costs a little, but I find it's worth it. Um, the reason why book clubs are such a great source of feedback is because they are used to tearing and discussing a book apart. And if you can actually be there for the meeting you, and be quiet, you know, don't be like, no, that's not what that character meant. Um, you will get a bird's eye view of your manuscript that will really have it in polished, beautiful form once you're ready to start pitching. So that is the when of pitching. And if you have questions, you guys, about the who, the when so far, just type them in the chat. Kim will get to them at the end. Okay. Let's move on to the where, which is very short because I just wrote a little funny, which is anywhere at all. Once you're in pitch mode, you'll be asking babies and strollers if they want to read your book. But seriously, conferences are the obvious candidates or when you're querying agents or small press independent micro publishers. But I call it Bolo, be on the lookout. You can run into people that you're gonna use this pitch in all manner of locations once you're in that mode. And I have sat next to a magazine reviewer for book page on a plane, an airplane. Um, I've met authors, I think I told you at book events. So, you know, where are you gonna pitch? You're gonna pitch wherever the opportunity comes to be. Let's talk about why you need this pitch before we get into the meat and potatoes of what the pitch consists of. So a pitch is the all time, you know, evolutionarily designed, well-honed beast of selling. It's just a great tool to sell a book. Three different aspects of why it works so well to sell a book. 
When we get into the what, we're going to discuss the very first line of your book, and we're going to discuss how it's targeted. We're going to discuss how it's heartfelt. The number one marketing principle, I think, I mean, I'm not a marketing person. In fact, in some ways I hate it, but I'm pretty sure I've read this like in business, you know, columns and things like that, is making that personal connection. And that's what you want your pitch to be. It's going to be more than anything else, an authentic representation of you as the author and the book. The ultimate selling tool, which we're going to discuss for a book, I, I, I wish we were in person because I would take a show of hands. But if you think about what the ultimate selling tool for a book is, hold on. This is what it is. Let's look at Lisa Gardner's new book. She has a new one. I'm sure you can get it from Mysteries Made on me. If you look at the ultimate selling tool for a book, it's right here, right? If you were reading online, which you would not get to do at Mysteries on Main, you can look at the actual books. But if you're reading online, you would have the book description. And that's called flap copy. And we're going to discuss how that works its way into your pitch. Flap copy is just a great way to sell a book. It encapsulates what the book is about. It hooks the reader. It's really well honed and designed by the publisher. Publishers work for months and months on the perfect flap to go on a book. And that's going to go into your pitch too, because it's a great selling tool. In the third paragraph of the pitch, which we will discuss in just a moment, you're going to put credentials if you have them, but you do not need them. And in fact, the why of why you don't need credentials is because New York publishing especially loves discovering a new and undiscovered talent. So if you have nothing to put in the third paragraph of the pitch, you're golden because all it means is that you don't have any kind of track record, you don't have any disappointing sales, you just have this brand new exciting book that you're going to be pitching. So let's talk about the what of a pitch and what it is. If I am able to do this, I want to put a link to everyone in the chat. Kim, I'm going to try this right now. And what this is going to be is a query writing template that you can follow along on. Just bear with me because I'm doing a little copying. I hope I can get back to the meeting and see all of you. Yeah. Okay. So let me see how I can put this. Or you know what, Kim? I'm going to put it in the chat and maybe you can share it with everyone. Okay, so what you should see, yeah, I think that just went to Kim, but if Kim shares that with everybody and you click on it and you open it, what you'll have is what essentially looks like a query letter or a pitch to follow along on as I tell you guys about the different parts. Okay, so let's get into what your pitch consists of. We talked a little bit about it in the, in the why. The very first line of your pitch is why you are contacting this particular person. So let's go with agents, just since that's the most common use case. You never want to blast agents. You're gonna be finding them in different ways. One way you can find them is online. You follow so-and-so agents Twitter feed or blog. You're gonna to wanna to say that in the very first line of your pitch. I'm reaching out to you because I love your Twitter feed and I you know, retweeted such and such um, the other day. Remember that the first line uh, the first rule of thumb, the marketing principle and why is making that personal connection. So the first line of your pitch, which you'll see if you're following along or you can look at it later after this workshop too, is going to be why you are reaching out to this particular person. A really great way to find agents in addition to online is in the acknowledgement section of books. Let's see if I can find one in Lisa Gardner's new book. Yeah. So look at this. Lisa wrote lots of notes and acknowledgements. And in the It'd be great if I could do a screen share, but we're kicking it so old school here because it's me. Um, in the author's acknowledgments in the books, they will often thank their agent or their editor. And that's a great, or both, and that's a great tool for you because if you're reading books that are in the same airspace of yours, books that inspired you, well, not only do you now, are you building a, a list of potential people to reach out to, but you're also figuring out how to, how, how to make the first line of your pitch, super targeted and specific. I read Lisa Gardner's before she disappeared. Lisa's one of my favorite authors, so I had to reach out to her agent. Now, even if it's a super big name author and you're not necessarily going to get to that agent, it doesn't matter because often if you've written a good enough pitch and you have an exciting project, the agent will pass it on to somebody who might be interested in taking on clients if perhaps they are too big at that point to be doing so. So the very first line of your pitch, very targeted, very specific, I'm reaching out to you because. 
And then of course I have a book that I am um, hoping to find representation for, or that I hope might be right for Polis Books, the imprint that you don't need an agent to go to, or you're reaching out to an author whom you know, you're a huge fan of, and you'd like to mention that you have a book because you're trying to collect blurbs in advance of querying agents or in advance of self-publication. This, this method, I feel like saying like, and don't wait, you'll get two for the price of one, because this method really works in all sorts of different writing situations. Um, okay, so that's the first line, targeted why you're querying or writing to this person. The second part of your pitch, if you're looking at that handout or if you come back to it later, I recommend like setting it off, blocking it and indenting. When I began querying, um, I've been published for eight years now, but I was trying to get published for 11 years before that. When I began querying, not only was there none of this, I mean, thank the goodness that there was no pandemic then because my kids would not be going to school. Not only was not there none of this, but there wasn't even email. And I sent out my query letters on cotton resume paper. And that allowed me, you know, to do a very nice, pretty, bolded, blocked off set of part paragraph. That paragraph in whatever form you're going to put it in your email now, your newfangled email, is going to be the flap copy, which I referred to before as like, you know, can't come up with a good analogy bad for a writer, but like the, the workhorse of selling books, just the perfect marketing tool to sell. So how are you going to write the flap copy for your particular project? You are going to, first of all, read tons and tons of flaps. You're going to go to your bookshelves. You're going to go to the library once the pandemic is over in the bookstores. You're going to take that drive to Mysteries on Main, or you're going to go online and read tons of the descriptions and go all the way through the read more part of it, because you really want to be eating, sleeping, breathing, dreaming, and flap, speak by the time you sit down to write yours. And then once you're ready to sit down and write yours, and you kind of have the, because it's a very specific uh, voice that, that flaps come in, and a certain structure. Once you sit down to write your flap copy, not going to do it yet. Remember the principle of when you think you're ready, you're not quite ready. It's at least proven true for me. Once you sit down to write your flap, you're going to read two books. One is by Robert McKee and it's called Story. And one is by Jessica Brody and it's called Save the Cat Writes a Novel. And these are great writing books about the form and the structure of a book. And they allow you, in addition to really being a nice check and balance for is my manuscript in good shape, am I on the right track, to get the bare bones of a book onto paper. And that's essentially what flap copy is. Flap copy is the scaffolding of a novel with some judicious parts dangled as like cookie kind of, I'm not going to tell you the whole thing, a lot held back. And then, you know, maybe five or six punchy little points that really give you a sense of the book and the writer's voice and stuff like that. So you're going to read those two books. And if for some reason you can't get your hands on them or you're on a book buying, you know, hiatus or whatever it is, I'll tell you very, very briefly an exercise you can do that sort of collate some of the knowledge in those two books, but I really recommend reading those books. But if you want to sit down and just practice today before anybody has delivered the books, even Patty on Mysteries on Main, and she is super fast. Um, if you just want to sit down today and work on this, like before the cocktail party, here's a great exercise to do to get your flap copy into shape. And it involves writing down five separate lines. So you're going to write down one line for what happens at the beginning of your book, what the inciting incident or the premise is. And then if you look over your manuscript or even the idea that you have bubbling along, if you're sort of in outline mode and you're at the kind of writer who outlines, you're going to find that at about the one third mark of your book, there's a turning point, a plot turning point. Something happens to shift the book in another direction. And sometimes I give this workshop and we really go into this five point exercise for a long time. We spend a while on it. And people are worried because it seems formulaic. Are you suggesting my book follow a formula? And I'm not. I mean, you know, I think my books are, are maybe not known for, but maybe one day they will be, for sort of being a little outside the genre box. So this is not a formulaic approach at all. It's an approach where if you sat down with The Great Gatsby, you'd probably find these five points. Books just, you know, whenever the novel came along, it, 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 the form kind of suits itself to this. So one line for the inciting incident or premise, one line for that one third turning point, one line for what happens at the middle of your book, 
and then one line for the two thirds plot turning point because it'll be there too. I mean, look at it. It's fascinating to see. Look at some of your favorite books and read them with this five point structure in mind. And then one line for the climax and the end. And once you have those five lines, you'll be able to shape those into flat copy. Number five, the line at the end will probably be whittled and carved carved a bit so it becomes more of a teaser than exactly what happens because if you read flap copy it's a teaser at the end it wants to pull the reader in to buy it not give you know the whole cow away or whatever um once you have those five lines though you can kind of whittle and morph them into really nice flap copy and don't be surprised if flap copy doesn't take you a while to write this is the body of your pitch this is the hardest part of it um but once you have it you're gonna have an incredible tool for the rest of time and they they do become a little easier to write, um, you know, once you've sort of done that once. A really good way to test the flap copy is to go back to our uh, pool of three and give it to just as many people from that pool as possible. Now all you're asking them to read is a paragraph essentially or two. It's flap copy usually ranges maybe 150 to 250 words at the outside limit. Um, so you're giving a much shorter piece of work to people. And what you want to know is would this make you want to read the book? And the brass ring of getting the flap copy right is, I don't even read your genre, but I would read this book. Um, or, or less so, you give it to mystery readers and they're like, yeah, this is a good solid mystery. This is the kind of stuff you read. So the flap copy is the body of your email. It goes in the center. You want to sell it to, you want to send it to agents, editors, other authors you're reaching out to, whomever, because it's a great selling tool. And it also does something else in your pitch, which I think is very important to talk about. Um, it's sort of a subtly, subtle psychological way of conveying to whomever you're pitching, this is gonna be a published book one day. We're all familiar with it. You know, Writers are readers, publishing people are readers. They're all familiar with it. And when they see a super polished pitch, what you're communicating to them is, hey, you're holding something in your hands that means this is going to be a published. So that is another really good reason to get your flap copy down. Um, yes, let me repeat the five flap copy steps. So this is an exercise that is sort of based on Robert McKee's story, um, which I do highly recommend. It's a big, thick book, but it's a great analysis of how stories work. But if you want to sit down today and be, you know, kind of twi you know, fiddling with this, you're going to write five lines. One is for the premise or inciting incident of your book. And it's interesting, you know, sometimes I give workshops on plot versus character, and that's always a line that writers and readers like to discuss. Um, the way I start my books is always with a premise and excite, inciting incident. I was gonna say exciting, because that's what kind of gets me, you know, juiced and wanting to sit down, like a huge what if. So the more exciting your premise or inciting incident is, write a line for that down. That's number one. Then you're gonna analyze either your outline or the story you have in your head or the written manuscript if you finished it and you're going to look at about the one-third mark of your book so if it's a you know 300 page book you're going to 100 yeah you're going to look around page 100 and you probably will find a scene at that point that sends your book in a different direction and by the way, if you if you do this exercise and you're like, I don't know what Jenny's talking about, before you're like, wow, I knew she was way too formulaic, ask yourself if it could hint at something in the book being off because of the manuscript. Because I have done this often enough times, even with myself, and being like, no, my one third turning point did not need to come here. It's actually a 50% turning point. And then when the book made its way to my agent, they were like, mm, I feel like the pacing is a little. So one of the way through your manuscript outline or the dream in your head, look for what happens to send the story shooting in another direction and write that down. Then you're gonna write down one line for what happens at the middle, the 50% mark. Then you probably have a two thirds turning point for the same reason you have the one thirds. So you're gonna look at, the math is getting super hard you guys, but whatever the two thirds mark of your whatever page manuscript is. And then you're gonna to wanna to write a line for the end, what happens in the climax of your book. But keeping in mind that when you transform this five point scaffolding into an actual flap copy, you're not going to give away the whole end. And instead what you're gonna do with that, it's a great question from Gloria, I'm gonna to get to it. Instead, what you're gonna do 
for that fifth line when it becomes flap copy in your pitch is you're going to morph it and whittle it so it just gives a juicy little teaser about the exciting event ways that things come together. And as I say, this will make a lot more sense if we really read tons of claps. And sometimes when I do this as a weekend workshop, we will sit, I'll ask people to bring their favorite books and we will sit reading the flaps and dissecting it and seeing how it uh, adheres and departs because good flap copy surprises too from this method. So Gloria, so Sue, let me know if that um, did not answer, if that did not clarify the five flap steps. Um, and Gloria asks how this works for a series. And that's a great question, Gloria. So what I would recommend first and foremost is to read the flaps, especially honing in on series. Read um, all the Reacher flaps. That's just a series that is especially long-lived and I think does a really good job of immersing the reader in each new entry, but letting them come in at any point in the series. But basically a flap copy is gonna work the same in a series book, except that you're going to have a character setting storyline that may have been already introduced, but on the flap, it's still going to, I'm stumbling a little bit because I don't, with the exception of Reacher, I don't read that many series, but I'm thinking of, you know, ones that I may have in the past. I mean, you're assuming that the reader doesn't know the series and they may be coming to book five as book one. So you still really want to get that flap to follow the customary form and to have your inciting incident. And it might say something like when it gets to publication level, and this is where, you know, some people ask me, well, I've written this great pitch and it got me an agent. Is this, should I give it to my, should I ask my agent to send it to my editor and that will maybe appear on the published book? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I have seen publishers use pitches that the uh, author came up with way back when. But, you know, publishers for a series will do something like beloved character Trixie Belden, you know, is back with, uh, you know, a new adventure in uh, a railroad yard or whatever it is. You don't have to worry so much about that. When you are pitching an agent, editor, or even an author, you're not so much going to mention that this is a series. You may say has series potential. You may say I'm already at work in the next, but you're certainly not going to want to make it sound as if um, you want to make it sound as if you have a book that the agent or editor could pick up and not worry about it being a series because just number one, the number one entry is exciting enough and it could exist as a standalone. Um, sometimes a writer is lucky enough to get a two book deal. And so then they know that the series will at least get two books through it. But sometimes they're going to want to see how book one does. So they definitely want something that could exist in a, a self-contained way. Now, another really good question about genre. So should the flap include genre? The answer to my mind would be it could. It's not necessarily something I put in, but it does fit very nicely in that first targeted line. So for example, dear Meg, I'm reaching out to you because I know you represent Lisa Gardner, and I have also written a psychological legal thriller that owes some inspiration to Lisa Gardner's work. So the first line is actually a very good place to get in genre. But I could imagine getting it into your flap because you could say something like, um, I don't know, this is getting a little hard to spontaneously, like I, it's not going to, it's going to be awkward. But like when, you know, when Ellie McBride heads off on um, a hike through the Grand Canyon, she does not expect the trip to go so terribly awry. And that's going to be an indication that while well, you've written a wilderness thriller. So I would say that flap is not where you're going. Flap is really what appears on the published book to entice the reader to read the published book. But I would say that genre could be gleaned from the flap, if that makes sense. Is it usual to use first names? I've seen that Oh, for the agent. Okay, so that's getting into um, the real nuts and bolts of how you're structuring the agent, Dear Sue versus Dear Ms. Jones. You know, it's an interesting question because it's changed a little bit just in the time since I've been querying where I think maybe it would have been a little safer to assume like a Ms. versus a Mr. Um, and the reason and the way they used to suggest getting out of that was to say the whole book, dear, the whole name, dear um, Brendan Fraser. So you didn't have to worry if this was, you know, Brendan who actually identifies as a, you know, uses she, her pronouns. Um, I think I want to get back. Who asked that about the surnames? I think I want to get back to you because I want to ask a couple of author friends who have queried more recently about what the etiquette is now. 
I think you probably could not go wrong with saying, dear Brendan Fraser, in other words, the agent's whole name. It comes out a little bit awkward, but you'll really avoid offending anybody. Um, so, but yeah, is that Christy? Okay, I'm going to, I, I'm gonna ask around. It's an interesting question. It's 2021, we need to do that. Okay, so we're gonna save time for questions at the end too. So if we didn't, if I didn't get to your question now, you're gonna print it again and we'll get back to it. So now you have your flap copy. That's the main body of your email, of your pitch. And you've taken a lot of time about it. You've given it to people to read. And what are you looking for when you give it out to people? Well, certainly that brass ring I talked about where somebody's like, I don't even read mysteries or main. I don't read series, but I would have to start in on yours because this is so compelling. But you're also looking for something else when you give your flap out. And that's very similar to the why you put your manuscript in the drawer. You're looking for people to say, wait, I don't get how, you know, remember you have your five point scaffolding. I don't get how you got from this incredible inciting incident to this turning point. It doesn't make sense to me. The story that we have in our heads and that we've been living with for you know, months or years or sometimes a lifetime uh, so far is super clear to us, but it doesn't always make it onto the page. And so when you're giving this flap copy out, you're directing people who read it, did it make sense to you? Did it flow? Are there places where you cannot understand what the book is from the flap? Essentially, the flap is like, Elizabeth Lyon also has a great book called The Sell Your Novel Toolkit. And she uses a metaphor called the accordion for pitching a book. When it's all closed up, the accordion, that's your flap. That's the smallest, tiniest chunk that represents the book. And as you bring it out a little bit bigger, well, then you have your pitch that has more stuff about you and the genre of the book where it fits. You bring it out a little bit more and then you have a synopsis, which is like a beat by beat of the book. They range in length. People can write synopses that are as long as a book, um, but usually when for pitching purposes, you're gonna write a synopsis of one to five pages. And then if you pull the accordion all the way out, then you have the book itself. So when you are pushing that accordion together and you're going from you know finished book or imagined book to a very, very narrow pitch, you're condensing greatly. And that's one of the biggest challenges when you sit down to write the flap copy that you'll face. And in that condensing, you can lose a lot of logical points that you wouldn't necessarily see, because as I say, they're all here and they're all in here, but readers who have no knowledge of your book will definitely stumble on them. That's why it's great to give the flap once you've written it to at least some people who have never seen your book before. And this is where it's handy that, you know, good flap copy, you're not asking people to read more than a couple hundred words. Um, you really can like be in the dentist office and see, I mean, after the pandemic and see somebody reading a uh, Lee Child book or Lisa Gardner book or whomever, be like, hey, I see you're reading a book. I'm a mystery writer. Can I ask you to read this and tell me if it would interest you at all? I mean, one of the biggest challenges I think I faced as a writer was learning how to reach out to people and ask, you know, ask for support, ask for help. Um, I am much more the type like, it, 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 you know, like my mom taught me not to show up at a party without bringing some food that that I had contributed. And it, it was very hard for me to get over that and just ask people who clearly were in the position where they could help me and what could I possibly do for them? Like, I'll come walk your dog for a few months. Like it's not gonna help them in the writing world. Um, but we have to do that. And we have to get used to the fact that we're entering a community and then the whole world widens, you know, because we get published and then we have readers and you start to realize that people really are interested in this business, interested in this craft. And if you ask that woman in, or man in the dentist's office, uh, to read your flap, they will probably be tickled and honored. And if they're not, and they're kind of like, no, why would I do that? Well, you'll just make them a character and kill them off in the next book. So flap copy, you're gonna give it to a lot of people. Um, <laughs> well, when the, Sindra says, it sounds like you're saying we have to talk to people. <sighs> you know, it's a writer's um, blessing and curse, right? Like this is a very interior life. We can be loners and do it, and that's wonderful. But eventually, unless we are writing in that garret for ourselves, which again, perfectly viable path. But if you're not, then yeah, we're gonna have to get you. And the reason why I say it like almost as like a, a you go kind of thing is because sometimes not wanting to talk to people is, at least for me, came from, I don't know if I'm worth it. I'm not, I don't know if you're gonna wanna hear what I have to say. And it can be very empowering to realize, wait, I, I do actually have a story to tell. 
and maybe some people are going to want to need it. And so, yeah, I mean, as much as you can, as much as is appropriate for the stage you're at, you know, reach out to some people and, and, and see if it doesn't go down a little easier than you think it might. And I do know writers who are complete introverts, will not go on a book tour. Um, so I'm not saying that's not possible. Writers come in as many, you know, shapes and sizes and versions as there are people on the planet, I'm sure. Um, but it, you know, yeah, if we, if we can get a little bit more extroverted, it's, um, yeah, it, 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 it can help. It can lead, I mean, truthfully, I think it can lead to unexpected places that we would not even imagine the joy of getting in there when we're sitting in our pandemic houses or our pre-pandemic houses and how we possibly can block the world out and just enter the world we're creating. That's a wonderful joy um, and a unique joy. And I think we're lucky to have that. Not everybody can. There are people you know, who if they had to be alone with characters for you know, a year or whatever to write a book, it would sound like the worst kind of heck. Um, so we're lucky to have that. But I do think that when we venture out of that comfort zone a little bit and start to think of ourselves as authors in addition to writers, it can lead to some pretty magical places too. Um, okay, so I wanna make sure we leave time for questions. So in the last couple of minutes, but, and then we'll go over to questions. I hope you guys will have a lot, but let's talk about the third paragraph of your uh, pitch. This is after a uh, flap copy. And it's kind of the dreaded credentials paragraph but it shouldn't be dreaded. My, my biggest pep talk to all of you guys is that if this column, if this paragraph has nothing, that's perfectly fine. Catherine Stockett published The Help. I think the book is questionable for all sorts of reasons, um, but it was a book that kept, it, it made Amy Einhorn's imprint um, at wherever she was then, Penguin. Um, it made it, it made her a publishing you know, phenomenon. Um, Catherine Stockett was, came out of nowhere. I don't think she's written another novel since. New York Publishing, you know, made enough money on that to keep going for several, several years. Or think of uh, E.L. James, who did have a big presence in the fan fiction world, but in the traditional publishing world, you know, came out of nowhere. Also kept Random House going enough that like when Random House acquired the Fifty Shades series, uh, the trilogy, this is true. I think this is true. I wasn't one of the people who got it, but apparently every Random House employee got a $5,000 bonus that year based on the sales of E.L. James's book that had already been self-published and sold millions of copies. So my point is that's the fantasy that New York Publishing is longing for. Undiscovered, you know, X, Y, or Z becomes phenom talent. If you have nothing in the third paragraph, that's fine. But if you do have some credentials, they're worth mentioning if they are big enough that they're gonna have a tangible effect on selling your book. So here are some of them. You've self-published and you've sold a lot of copies, worth mentioning. You've had short stories published in recognizable publications. It doesn't have to be like the Paris Review, but you've had a story published in one of the sync anthologies or one of the short story zines or print magazines that people have heard of mention that. Um, you have a non-fiction-y kind of platform that might support this book. So for instance, Tammy Uliano just released her debut mystery. It's kind of a medical thriller, came out from Ocean View. I think it's called Fatal Intent. I'm sure Patty at Mysteries on Main can order it for you. Um, Tammy is an anesthesiologist and this mystery has a heck of an anesthesiology uh, component. When Tammy queries, she should certainly you know, mention that. You have a real world kind of non-fiction-y background platforming Thing that will help the release, mention that in the third paragraph. If you have a blog that's well-trafficked, if you have an online social media presence that has a good number of followers, but remember, if anybody's having palpitations as I list these and it's like, I don't have any of that stuff, I had none of it. I mean, there was no social media when I started trying to get published. Um, I had none of it and I cold queried and you know, yes, it took me a while, but that's mostly primarily because I didn't go to great conferences like uh, Murderous Mark. Um, and I didn't really get myself out of my comfort zone and, and make those connections. Um, if you have something like this, great. This is going to go in the third paragraph of your pitch. If you don't, you're not going to worry about it because you're going to know that you're simply presenting whoever you're pitching to the fantasy of, um, you know, completely fallow, fertile ground. So your third paragraph is that. And then your fourth is your sign-off. It's very brief. It's very easy. Um, the completed 
a partial or completed manuscript is available upon request. Um, Sometimes you'll be pitching and you'll include like five or 10 pages of the body of your pitch. Sometimes they want nothing but the pitch. Sometimes you're in person at a conference, so you're clearly not giving anybody pages because if everybody who pitched did that, they would be like buried under paper by the end. Um, so the third one is just a polite sign off referring to the manuscript completed and ready for review. And then yours truly sincerely cheers um, warmly. Uh, read my new novel. I'll talk about it tonight at the cocktail party, and you'll hear why never to use warmly in your uh, in your sign off. But send sign off that says who you are, and that's it. That's your pitch. It was so easy, and it's one minute before we have ten minutes left for questions. So I would love to take questions. Um, I think Kim is going to be moderating them. If I missed any, Kim, please let me know. Um, and really, like I said, I know it was a lot of information, so, and I might have hurried over some of it, so ask me back. We did the who, where, the what, the why of pitching. And then some of you might have that pitch document open, and if you're looking it over and you want, you, it lends itself to questions, feel free to do that too. So info about doing this in person, that's a great question. So if you do go to Pitch Fest at Thriller Fest or the New York Writers Workshop Perfect Pitch or Sync sponsors a pitch conference, you're gonna be sitting down with someone. Um, and the answer is that this is infinitely adaptable. So even if you just wanted to think in terms of, okay, I'm gonna sit down, um, I'm gonna have done my research on the people I'm pitching to beforehand if at all possible, right? So you go to the conference and you learn that in an hour or tomorrow, you're gonna to be pitching one, two, and you know, X, Y, and Z people, and you're gonna quickly you know, Google them. Great if you can sit down and be like, I'm so glad I got to pitch you because I see that you represent or publish such and such, and I've read their book. If this is a total lie or a stretch, don't do it. But if there's anything you can come up with that really does let you, people who are at pitch conferences are used to and expecting people to be doing this because they just want the experience pitching, and that hour maybe they hope that it'll be a good fit kind of accidentally. And that's fine, that's how it's used. But if you can come up with that personal connection, which goes in the body of your pitch when you're doing it as a letter, um, that's a great way to sit down, sit down and make it personal. And then, yeah, you're going to use that flap copy. I've done um, Pitch Fest at Thriller Fest probably five or six times now. And sometimes I've seen people like read, you know, the pitch to me, just the paragraph, they've read it straight off. Sometimes they've memorized it because it is only maybe 150, 175 words. So they've memorized it and gone through it. And sometimes they take that nice flap copy, which is all polished, and they kind of morph it into more conversational things like, so my character is Jack Reacher, and he shows up outside a hardware store one day, but they're still using the flap copy. Don't do that because they probably won't believe that you know what they're picture. Um, they, you know, you're using the flap copy to give the body of your, um, pitch even in person and yeah the uh, credentials same thing if you are an anesthesiologist and you just wrote an anesthesiologist thriller mention that it, it goes a long way and if not say I am brand new to this and uh, I'm very excited to be here thank you for your time so Rachel Morrison is saying the four paragraphs for reference so this is a four paragraphs Rachel in the pitch letter um, I'm going to assume that's so. And if you click on that link, which I think Kim shared, and if she did not, I can share it with people later. Come to the cocktail party and you know follow up. Um, but if it's the four paragraphs in the pitch, so it's going to be the opening line, which is targeted and specific. Why are you reaching out to this particular person? How does it relate to the book that you've written? Then the second paragraph is your blocked off like flap copy paragraph. The third is any credentials you have. And if that doesn't exist, you're just going to skip right to paragraph number four, which is your sign off. Thank you. A full or completed manuscript is available upon request. Or if they haven't read anything, a partial manuscript is available upon request. A full or partial manuscript. Is that the four questions? I feel like there's some pass on the connection here. So Carolyn says you're going to fight and signing up. Hmm. This is so strange. Did I mention that? Going to a site and signing up. Was it my website for a newsletter? If not, if I didn't mention that, I am lax. I should have. Please, everybody go to my website, jennymiltron.com. Sign up for my newsletter. Sometimes I do giveaways where I read people's pitch as the prize. Um, and there's just a lot of writerly fun stuff. And 
once you have a book published, I showcase authors in my spotlight. Um, Jenny, I think maybe also she might have been thinking that uh, if you bought a book at the store, you said you could uh, take a screenshot of the receipt and send yes. you an email and you would be uh, basically put in for a possible prize winning. So that yes. might've been the other thing. It's a good time to remind people about that. I just put the Dropbox link up again. Um, and I know we had one person who was questioning um, if you are traditionally published, is it, that, is it supposed to be mentioned in that third paragraph? Uh, good point. Great point. Okay, so let, let yes. First of all, buy a book from Mysteries on Maine. It does not have to be mine, but I would love it if you did buy one of mine, of course, because then we can talk about my books. And this is another thing I would recommend if you're reaching out to authors or you're referencing authors, really know their work, like make it authentic. Um, but anyway, if you go to Mysteries on Maine to support the bookstore, anybody who buys a book today, send me a screenshot of your receipt. You'll be entered into a drawing. One person will win a writer's wish list. A writer's wish list consists of a chapter or a query critique by me, a half hour phone console, and a resource list um, that's tailored to your individual need. So enter the drawing, support Mysteries on Maine. Thank you, Patty, for doing this for us, uh, for the Mavens. It's so wonderful. And then there was something else that was, oh, being a published author. So that's a great question. If you are a published author, um, you know, a, 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 I would basically mention that I think in the first paragraph. Um, yes, of course, it's a credential. And in the third paragraph, you might say things like, um, my debut novel received a nice blurb from, or a starred review from, or was chosen as, or hit number one in psychological fiction on Amazon, something like that. Um, that could go in the third paragraph, but I would probably put really right up in front and center. Hi, my name is uh, Frankie Bailey and I'm the author of blah, 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 published by blah, blah, blah. Just because at that point you're querying, you're pitching a new novel, but they know that they're talking to somebody who's kind of already run a certain gauntlet and it is a gauntlet. So other questions? Jenny, I don't see any others in chat. Uh, if someone has a question, it's a good time to add it in because we're running out of time and you want to get I the know. last ones in. It goes super fast, but I really am available on the web via email. Please do keep in touch. And I hope to see everybody later at the cocktail party. And yeah, if you have another question, click it in because we still have three or four minutes. Um, but. Right. It's been great talking with all of you. And Frankie, thank you for the intro. And Kim, thank you for all the uh, Maveny tech support. Jenny, we keep getting questions about the two books that you uh, okay. recommend. Would you just go over those again so make sure everyone hears it? Yeah, and then I also see a good question from Mitch. Um, okay, so the books that I recommended, Robert McKee, Story, and Jessica Brody, Save the Cat, Writes a Novel. Save the Cat, I mean... You know, one of the first mystery lessons I ever got was don't kill the cat. Mystery readers can't stand that. And I mean, who would kill an adorable little kitty? But yeah, be, who would? Stephen King. I still can't get that kitty out of my mind. Um, Pet Cemetery. Anyway, Save the Cat is a book on screenwriting. And Jessica Brody adapted this brilliant formulation of how to write a screenplay for novelists. So Jessica Brody, Save the Cat, writes a novel. Um, yeah, and then Nanette is saying that she's attended Robert McKee's I guess he does workshops on his, his method. I, I think the book is genius. I really do. And hopefully I give him credit because the five point thing came, you know, it was a direct war from his book into my brain. So um, that's amazing. Then that. So Mitch asked if you have experience in like other genres and I think he mentioned film. Um, so the main principle with that third paragraph, the credential paragraph, or even if you're putting it up top as we talked about with published authors, the main principle is super touchy feely. And it's, if it's a resume stretcher, if it's like, you know, <laughs> my kids just apply, you know, went through the National Honor Society. <laughs> I should not sell them out on Zoom. I don't know how many people, but we have to stretch things, right? I mean, first of all, it's been a pandemic. They haven't been out volunteering. And you could feel it. Like, I was like, what about that summer camp you ran? That's a total volunteer effort. Nobody paid you. But you could feel that you were kind of reaching for examples. If you're reaching for it, don't worry about it. But if you have experience that really kind of elevates you, by all means mention it. And film is a natural, you know, kind of corollary. I have a good writer friend named Nina Sadowski. I also recommend you look up her books. I'm sure Patty can get them for you. Um, and she was a producer on The Wedding Planner with Jennifer Lopez. And I can tell you that that, um, 
Laura says, if that's my website, Laura, JennyMilchman.com, I will have to look and see if there's how it's having any technical difficulties. In fact, I'm going to look right now. Hold on. Can you see if my website is going? Um, but that is the correct spelling, Jenny Milchman, M-I-L-C-H-M-A-N.com. And it, my tech guy here is saying it's fine. So if you're having problems, email me and we'll, we'll walk you through it. Um, oh, good. Um, so if you're not reaching, for example, oh, so Nina, when New York Publishing heard about the producer credit on the, you know, that spoke volumes to them. So if you have credits that are going to elevate you, you know, by all means, list them. Just don't stretch for them because they're not necessary. And then I, there's a question about where do you mention number of uh, pages and the word count. Genre, we talked about a little bit as maybe going in that first line. And it's a natural fit if you say, I'm querying you because I'm a huge fan of Lee Child. Um, and I too have written a series that could be called a Western thriller. So genre fits very naturally when you explain why you're reaching out to this particular person. Somebody else had a question about whether it could be worked into a slap, and I think it could be in creative ways, but probably wouldn't be mentioning a specific genre. We'd be more giving away what the genre is when you describe those five points. Um, and you know, walking, taking your when you take your reader through the events of the novel the genre is going to certain, sort of, in a way, emerge. But if you want a specific how, what kind of genre this is, I think it belongs in that first paragraph better. Word count and number of pages, forget about number of pages. Um, it's word count, which you can, you know, calculate pretty easily. You know, it's not going to hurt. You can certainly put it in there. I know there are some people who are like, I must have word count. Um, you can put it in. I've written a 95,000 word suspense novel that is reminiscent of Lisa Gardner, so I'm reaching out to you. There are ways you could put it in um, kind of naturally. And you can always say in that very last sign off, the completed 95,000 word manuscript is available upon request. So you can get it in, especially if somebody's super hardcore like they want it. Um, I don't tend to be picky in about those things, but I'm not an acquisitions editor, so <laughs> why does what I think matter? Okay, one last quick question. How do you determine, wow, and Nanette asks the question of all questions. It's hard is the answer, especially if your work sits between genres. If you've written a book that's clearly in one genre, um, it'll be easier for you. The first way I would do it is to think about which books you curl up with. And that's how I really clarified what I wanted to write and then down the line what I was pitching. Um, think about the books you curl up with at night. This doesn't work 100% of the time because, of course, sometimes we read very differently from what we write, but it's a good starting point. Um, you want to try to determine what the book, is, what genre the book falls into. And sometimes readers can do that better than um, you can. Sometimes you'll have a very good idea, but sometimes readers will do that. Like they'll read it and be like, oh, I don't even usually read hard boiled noir. And you're like, I didn't know I wrote hard boiled noir. That's if it's a reader who has sort of a sense of genre. And if worse comes to worst, you can always, you know, go to the bookstore, peruse online, look through books that you're pretty sure are a good starting point, like um, you have written a series, so you just go to a, another series, very broad brushstrokes, and then you follow the you may also likes down that rabbit hole, and you start drawing books out. I mean, the best way to determine this is really just to read so widely across genres that eventually you're like, like ah, this is very similar. And if all else fails, I mean, the reason we have like in Hollywood, to go back to Mitch's uh, point about experience in film, the reason we have like Jaws meets Star Wars, which you would never use as a pitch. Um, the one thing we didn't get into is comp, so maybe we can do that at another time. Um, the reason why you Hollywood likes A meets B is because what you're trying to go for in your pitch is that you've written something that's the same because you don't want to freak New York Publishing out and say, I've written something that's never seen before. A, it's not likely to be true. And B, they would be not know what to do with it if it were true. But it's different. So it's the same, but different. And so when you think about what books yours are like, hopefully you're going to have this book and this book, a blend of or shares attributes with or owes some inspiration to, but not just one thing, because if you just wrote, you know, the Lack Meacher series, somebody's going to be like, this is derivative, we don't need to publish this. You know, Lee Child's already earned us a gazillion dollars. And yes, Tina's point is great. Sometimes a reader will tell you that your book 
reminds them of such and such. Jenny, I wanted to thank you so much. Everyone, we are about to go to break. If you still have questions for Jenny, I, I'm guessing you'll hang around and, and, and deal yeah. with the chat for a few minutes here. And then remember, you can also contact her through her website on her email.